There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy. Does anybody know where that comes from? Good. Can we get the play? It's Hamlet. Hamlet. And it's right, it absolutely is right that um, there is more to this life than meets the eye. Things are not always as they seem, and first appearances often deceive. We watched a movie last week called The Way. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's, um, it's a super movie. It's about a group of people who sort of come together um, while on pilgrimage, traveling the Camino de Santiago. And um, as they travel, the masks that they're all wearing start to slip, and who they really are starts to become more apparent and what's left is often a kind of more humbler more real or honest version of themselves and in that place they are each enabled in their own way to encounter God it's a really amazing film and um, the truth about so many things in life about people um, is that they are not always who they appear to be and that the truth of us is not found without a journey uh, a process of understanding and looking carefully and seeking. And if that's true of us, it is infinitely more true of Jesus. So the context of this reading, which really is the mountaintop of Mark's gospel, is that we've been on this long journey. Do you remember? We've been looking through this remarkable and life-changing story And in this moment, these three very privileged disciples really get to see things that they will not see again this side of eternity. But I just wanted to kind of look back on the journey and just remember how we got here. I love Mark's gospel and I don't want it to quite pass us by. Let's just remember where it began. Do you remember the gospel starts, this is the beginning of the good news And it's clear that what's going on here isn't a philosophy or even particularly a religion, but a message, good news from God for everyone. And the first person we met was John the Baptist, who is the Elijah in the reading we just had. And he's this amazing figure who goes out into the wilderness. And do you remember he calls everybody out to repent, to be baptized, and essentially to start all over again. We talked about the fact that they essentially go back to the borders of Israel in order to begin again the project which had gone so badly wrong. And John the Baptist's agenda really is that there's no real difference between the apparently moral and the apparently immoral. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we're all part of the problem. All of us need to repent and be willing to start over. And so that was why then Jesus was able to sort of be the friend of sinners. Do you remember? He got in quite a lot of trouble because he'd go and have dinner parties with the most unlikely people and the religious folks looked down their nose on what he was doing. But he was like, well, everybody needs a doctor. Um, I am here uh, to seek and save the lost. And all of us need forgiveness. And then there were some lovely moments, some of the really standout ones for me. Do you remember the story of the paralyzed man who was lowered through the roof by his faithful friends? And Jesus looked at him and said, son, your sins are forgiven. And everybody was sort of outraged on two counts, really, because they said, well, who is is he to, to say your sins are forgiven? Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. And also, surely the man has more pressing needs than his sins forgiven. But Jesus is like, well, fine tells him to get up and walk but actually the most precious thing is sins forgiven because they last forever and then there was that lovely story of the woman who touched the hem of the robe of Jesus and isn't just healed but you remember he stands her up in the crowd and he kind of reconciles and restores her to her place in her community and in her family and in her society that what the gospel does is it heals and restores and reconciles us it's a message of good news for everybody but it needs to change us 
It needs to actually do the job that it's intended for. And so then we looked at the parable of the sower. And we talked about the fact that the the gospel, the, the word is like a seed which lands on different types of soil. And not all of them bear good fruit. And the one that we particularly put our finger on was the type which grew up amongst thorns and weeds and that they sort of choked the life out of it. And Jesus said this, he said, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for more things and the worries of life come in and choke the life of the seed. And that's a real danger for us. We need to make a choice about who it is we are serving, what kingdom we are part of, like Peter standing at the gates of Caesarea Philippi and declaring that Jesus was Lord, not Caesar, that he chose to be part of God's kingdom and not the empires of this world. And then finally, last week, do you remember, we looked at that rather uncomfortable story of the rich young man who seemed to have it all together, but ultimately he couldn't let go of the idol of his wealth, which had seized his heart. So that's the journey we've been on, and it brings us now, as I say, to the mountain top, to the turning point in the journey. And what will happen now is we'll turn around and we'll head back towards Jerusalem, although we'll do most of that after Christmas. We're going to take a, a little bit of a break during the Christmas period. But verse 2 says this. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone, and there he was transfigured before them. Now, this is in that absolute category of there being more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy. Anybody who knows, claims to know what's going on here, I think is probably mistaken. It's an act and a moment of real mystery. It's a proper mountaintop experience, and nobody can really say for sure what's happening here, but it clearly had a profound effect on the three disciples who were there with him. What can we say about it? Well, the word transfiguration comes from the Greek word from which we get the word metamorphosed. So Jesus is somehow changed in this place. And he's radiant, did you see, with a sort of a light unlike anything that has been seen on earth. There are glimpses of this elsewhere in scripture. So do you remember when Moses goes up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And he comes down and he's sort of, he's radiant too. And the people are sort of slightly blinded by him. And they're like, you know, could you you cover your face, please? It's, It's bothering us. And so there's something about the presence of God, the actual presence of God, which is a transformative um, uh, experience for people. If you want my theory as to what this is, my best guess is this. That what we see at the transfiguration, what the disciples see at the transfiguration, is a glimpse of eternity, a glimpse of heaven. At this point, the kind of the gap between heaven and earth just breaks for a moment. And Jesus is seen, well, you could say, as he really is. You remember, um, there's a lovely line in Philippians that talks about the fact that Jesus humbled himself and took the form of a servant. He didn't think that. Equality with God was something to be held on to, and so he became like, uh, he took on human likeness. And maybe just at this moment, the form of a servant lifts and his true nature is seen. Remember what we're going to be celebrating at Christmas time. Emmanuel means God with us. If this is who Jesus really is, then the implications of that, of course, are absolutely enormous. Jesus is infinitely more than he appears, than he seems at first glance. And if he is, then he is the only one worthy of our loyalty. And if you're not quite clear on the implications of this, it is made very clear for us. So in verse 7, cloud descends, hides them from sight. And then a voice came from heaven and it said, this is my son whom I love. Do what? Listen to him. In many ways, this is the simplest sermon I've ever preached. You can forget everything else because actually that's the only thing that really matters here. And the reason for this story and the reason why this had such an implication and an impact on those disciples is because that was it. It was the realization that if Jesus is who we believe he is, then you must listen to him. 
Life is found in him. He is the only one who is greater than he appears. Don't be led astray by the vainglory and self-seeking of our world. Seek that which is true. Look carefully and you too can catch a glimpse of eternity in the person of Jesus. And then live in the light of that. A voice came from heaven and said, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. A couple of other reflections before I finish, just really out of interest. What about the Moses and Elijah thing? Why, does he, why is he talking with Moses and Elijah? Well, Elijah, well, there's a, a few reasons why this might be the case. They are hugely significant figures in the Old Testament. Um, Moses essentially sums up the law. Elijah is the prophets. That is the whole of the Old Testament. And essentially, they are, are all pointing to Jesus. The whole of the Old Testament scripture points to Jesus. But I found that a rather sort of pragmatic um, answer to the question because I think there's some other really interesting details with these two figures. Um, so, for example... Um, both of them, in their own lives, left palaces and left worldly glory in order to go out into the wilderness and to, to be a prophet and to, to speak the word of God. And there's a real kind of echo of Jesus there. Both sort of interceded for their people, stood between the people and God, and sought and succeeded in reconciling people to God, which again... A profound echo of what Jesus does. Both knew despair in that process, as it seemed impossible, as it seemed it would never succeed. They knew real low points and yet came through that. And so I think it's a lovely thought that actually these are the two people best placed to speak with Jesus as he looks back towards Jerusalem and to the cross and to the events of Passion Week. I really like that idea. I think it's a really important one for us to grasp that Jesus, in all his humanity, has to come to terms with what he is doing. He has to sort of emotionally um, go on that same journey, which will, of course, come to its head in the Garden of Gethsemane. And these two hugely significant figures are the best place people to help Jesus to face up to what he's going to do next. Lastly, Peter opens his mouth and puts his foot in it again. He even admits that he had no clue what he was talking about. I wonder whether what he was... Did you see there was a sort of strange thing about putting up tents? <laughs> I mean, Peter, what, uh, what is that? My suspicion is it's this. My suspicion is that the mountaintop experience was so profound, yes, terrifying, but astonishing, that he wanted to sort of stay there. You know, after the long journey, you reach the summit... And, um, you know, maybe maybe this is where we're supposed to be now. We're we're going to stay here. But, of course, the truth is that in life, in the life of faith, you don't get to stay at the mountaintop. You know, when you're climbing a mountain, you don't get to stay at the mountaintop either. Um, You can't hold on to that experience. You need to go back to kind of everyday life and live in the light of that experience that you've had. And, of course, that is exactly what they did that these three, Peter, James, and John, all went on to be enormously significant um, in the early church. So, where does that leave us? If you take nothing else from our reflections this evening, that sense of a Jesus who is infinitely more than he appears, and infinitely more than people know, infinitely more than our world judges him to be. And if you judge him by appearances or by the court of popular opinion, you will never find your way to him. But he promises that if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open to you. If you ask, it will be given to you. God calls each of us on a pilgrimage of faith, a journey of discovering which may strip away the masks that we're wearing and leave us humbled but more honest. But he will meet us in that journey. And there may be mountaintop experiences and there may be very low experiences on it. 
But ultimately, what we're doing through our whole pilgrimage is simply learning to be obedient to the voice of God who says, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Amen.